Hey everyone, have you ever wondered how to turn your worst days into your biggest strengths? Stay tuned to find out. Raw, uncut, and unapologetic. Welcome to Men Talking Mindfulness. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Men Talking Mindfulness. Today, we're chatting with Brett Cotter, the man behind Stress is Gone and the author of Three Keys to Managing PTSD. And Brett's been in the game for over 25 years, helping people turn their trauma into triumph. And today, he's here to share some of his magic with us. Brett, welcome to the show, brother. John, Will, thanks so much for having me on. I'm so excited to be with you guys. As are we, yeah, as hey. are we. I know. We appreciate you being here, Brett. Uh, hey, and we are back. Uh, this is our official first recording for season nine. I know we've yeah, released some yeah. other content, but we are in season nine. We are getting, we're approaching 200,000 downloads. Thanks to all of you. Uh, and I think, what are we at? Like 179, 180 episodes yeah, or something, John? Like just, incre just incredible. So <laughs> thank you everybody for being out there and listening and tuning in, but also like sharing uh, everything men talking mindfulness. And if you want to connect more intimately to our community, uh, or how about becoming a sponsor, keeping our show alive? Uh, you can simply text uh, MTM uh, and in the phone number line, just put in 33777. So again, just simply in the, um, the message line, put MTM and text to the number 33777 and we'll uh, tie you in to Men Talking Mindfulness. Or hey, if you want to see other things that we have going on, we're going to be launching some uh, meditation courses later this year. You can go to mentalkingmindfulness.com to check all that out. So um, great to have you all here. Brett, awesome to be here. What well, you know, same deal, man. We're going to do, uh, even in season nine, as I got fruit flies, you know, <laughs> flying around. I, when I was, right, so, so I'm going to be like, anyway, I know I'm being mindful and not being stressed out with fruit flies. You know, um, we're just going to do a one breath grounding practice and maybe the flies will get out of my fucking face. I'm just <laughs> right. Okay. Exhale, exhale all the way out with that breath. <laughs> let it go. Let it go. Feel the grounding of your feet as you exhale. And let's take one big, beautiful inhale. Fill it up a little bit more. And just hold that breath nice and easy for three, two, one, and exhale. See if you can find more of that grounding into the feet and just slow things down as you slow the breath down. And uh, there we are. Um, John, uh, why don't you just jump right in? Uh, yeah. And uh, it's great to be back, man. It's a little weird. I got to say, it's a little weird. Like, we have not recorded an episode together in over a month. Uh, so wild. we apologize, <laughs> a little rusty, but it'll definitely <laughs> continually contribute to the authentic nature of our show, uh, right. which, which keeps and us if, going. If you're Will, uh, a regular, yeah. sorry, go ahead, Brett. Oh, no, Will's fruit fly situation reminded me of a story I heard of a yogi. <laughs> in India with all of his devotees around him with flies all around him. And he had a fly swatter. And every time he hit a fly on him, he would say another fly in paradise. <laughs> I know. Fly in paradise. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's true. I know. And what, what's up, what's up with ahimsa nonviolence, you know, you know, know right? flies. Like, who, who is this guy? Who is this guy? Anyway, I mean, here's my rule. If you attack me like a mosquito or fruit fly, I'm going to attack you. You know, so uh, anyway, that's just the way that's, I roll. That's my but rule let's, for, let's jump for anything, not just, not <laughs> just fruit. <laughs> no. Good point. Good point. Good point. Right. But uh, we, we don't have to. Yeah. Anyway, so I'm just gonna, let's go. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in here in a second. But I also have to say to our audience, to our community, if you if you notice a little bit something different in what Will and I have as our background, sometimes we have our green screens down and we have our logo and it's it's much more kind of formal. I'm actually on I'm not on vacation. I was about to say I'm on vacation. I'm I'm in between homes. We just sold one house and we're having another one built. So we're oh, staying yeah. at my brother-in-law's place in Florida in Santa Rosa Beach and uh, enjoying the sun, enjoying uh, a little bit of a tan. Uh, but I don't have everything that I normally have I'm on my laptop. So hopefully this records properly and sounds good. And Hopefully you guys can bear with us with our uh, our raw backgrounds. But hey, as the show goes, it's raw, uncut, and unapologetic. <laughs> so I won't apologize <laughs> for the background. I'm just making a statement. About oh, it. I know. Uh, I'm, I'm turning on my air conditioner and my fans. Like I'm afraid I'm going to glitch <laughs> out again. <laughs> anyway, I just uh, this is just a mess. Or not a mess. This is men talking mindfulness. Everybody, this yeah, is how we right. roll. Um, <laughs> and will you so, actually uh, be proud? Actually, Brett probably too. 
I'm sitting on the ground. I'm not sitting on a chair. Oh. I'm literally sitting on the ground, legs crossed. So you may see me shifting around a couple of times, <laughs> but uh, I am grounded, quite literally. Yeah. Uh, you, so you, you, you're evolving. Yeah. John. I am evolving. I am evolving. And you know, all right. One of the things, one of the things in our retreat that just ended last weekend, we had oh, nice. uh, 15 veterans in it, about 35 people all together. And uh, one of the things was life is sloppy. Mm, How do we deal is. with the slop? <laughs> right. Got it so right. I, yeah. yeah. Right. Embrace it. Embrace I, I, or laugh at it. I think you can see we laugh at it a lot and it really makes everything <laughs> a little bit better. You know, so that's it. That's the show, everybody. Just laugh a little bit. <laughs> You know, and everything is going to be all right. Uh, okay, okay, we we got to get we got to get serious here, John. All right, all right. Ask so a let's, let's do that. So, hey, Brett, uh, again, welcome to the show. Let's let's talk about how you got into what it is you're doing, and then kind of what drew you to helping people manage their stress and their trauma. Yeah. Yeah. So, since I was a young kid, I always felt like there was something more something more that we weren't seeing. I was always interested in psychology, took my first elective my junior year in high school. And I remember being in that class asking Mr. St. John, who was my teacher, um, saying, I have a fear of heights. My uncle, who was in Vietnam, he was in the Navy. He used to hang me upside down over like these small bridges and mountains by my ankle and like pretend he was dropping me. Right. Oh, and I said, do you think that has anything to do with my fear of heights? And he's like, absolutely. So Man. that kind of like was the first time I started to put, like to connect the dots between my behavior and my past. And then I studied psychology in college. And when I moved to California, I realized I had a big issue around relationships. I was like a jealous, angry mess after the 18 month mark. Right. And mm -hmm. all of my relationships, when I look back on them, had the same pattern from 18 months to three years. Jealousy just came out. My teeth came out. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, I started meditating. And then, crazy sequence of events from California, I got connected to a healer in Sedona, Arizona. I drove out to him that weekend from Orange County, California, did a session with him. And within the first five minutes, Cellular memories bubbled up from my body to my conscious mind of my father and mother arguing when I was five years old. Wow. And it was the same exact way I argued with all my exes, every single one of them. Wow. It was where wow. I absorbed in the blueprint. Right. And right. just to summarize that story in another minute, it was like once that memory popped up, I felt all the jealousy, then the rage. Um, once that released, I started to feel the sadness underneath it. And when the sadness released, I felt all the fear of abandonment. And when that oh. released, I was free of that pain. It left my heart, my solar plexus, and my stomach. That took about 90 minutes. Since that day, that was 25 years ago, um, jealousy has never ruined another relationship. So it changed my behavior 90 minutes later. So ever since that day, I've been like a moth to a flame to this work. Um, mm -hmm. I learned from him for a few years. I learned from a Shaolin Grandmaster from China and a number of other really talented people. Um, yeah, in my in my past. Nice, beautiful. Wow. I mean, what a story. And and it's it's incredible what what the body holds on to that we're not aware of, right? The body keeps right. the score. I'm sure all three of us have read that. Um, but also, once you release it how powerful that is for, for you to move forward. It's, it's truly like we're carrying this, this weight on our shoulders and it, it slows us down, bears us uh, uh, or, or weighs us down and dropping that rock. Now we can move mm -hmm. forward and feel so much lighter. That's awesome, Brett. Great to hear. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. And from hearing you talk about it and I'm, and I see kind of like Will right there too, the three of us know what that feels like when we drop that weight. And it's almost like you didn't know you were carrying that much weight until you let it go. And right. then you're yeah. like, oh, wow, this is what it's supposed to feel like without it. You know? Right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, so how are you helping people like, uh, you know, drop that weight? You know, like, uh, it, well, yeah. I mean, just like, what are some of the common... I know we're getting way off schedule here, John, as far as questions, but <laughs> yeah, like, but like, uh, you know, so what are some of the, cause you work with a lot of veterans, which I really, you know, I mean, John's a veteran. You, we have a lot of veterans that are connected to the show. Um, and you know, veterans carry a lot of, uh, trauma, PTS, 
PTSD. What are we also calling it, John? I like it. Post traumatic stress injury, yeah. right? PTSI mm -hmm. as well. Um, and I mean, are you able with the work that you're doing to, you know, help to release some of that burden, uh, you know, within that like 90 minutes, or does it take a little bit more time, or everybody's a little bit different? Um, so walk us through that a little bit, please. So. In a nutshell, what I do is when I'm with somebody, I ask intuitive questions to surface the core pain from their cellular memory. That takes about three to five minutes, sometimes even quicker. Yeah. And then I guide them through these words that release the pain from their cellular memory and from their body. And when that happens, it mm. shakes free from their central nervous system. And it's like we pluck the trauma memory from the amygdala and pull it into a pleasure center as they're expressing all their pain, and then they call in their higher power. So in a nutshell, I surface the pain from the subconscious, I call in the higher power, and we merge it together. And once you activate the subconscious, and we start to use these higher power affirmations, you actually mm. feel the layers of pain releasing from your body. And that's when it becomes mm. real to the individual. Whether or not they believe in a higher power, it doesn't matter. Mm. I use the word that they have an affinity towards. So some people don't believe in a higher power, but they'll acknowledge, acknowledge that the universe exists. So we'll use the word universe where you would normally put in the word for a higher power. So mm. it's almost like they're commanding the universe mm. to shine light through and unlock and release the area of the pain inside their body and inside the old memory and reclaim their true identity. And when I guide them through that, through words, and they're repeating after me, they're claiming their stake in this reality, unlocking and releasing all the old emotions that were trapped in the temporary in the back of the psyche. Mm. Wow. What, what about, like you mentioned twice now, uh, and it's something actually kind of new for our community. Uh, it's like we're at this, what you say, at the cellular level or embedded and how does like so why that term and 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 how does that kind of help us to really understand like what trauma or what this burden is because it when you say that it sounds like it's really deep inside of us so you can just kind of like maybe help us to understand what like the, the basics of, of of your approach and and on that deepest level of our biology yeah, yeah. So I like to think of trauma and our kind of perspective on reality and our body as like an iceberg, right? So if you have an iceberg like this, right, you have the big part of the iceberg on the bottom and like right above the water line, let's say the water line's right here, mm -hmm. right? Right above that is all the stress that we see and that we're aware of, okay? Mm -hmm. But it's the ice below the water line down here that sunk the Titanic. That's below the conscious level. Okay. So yeah. we might be aware of, you know, one or two traumatic memories or maybe a slew of traumatic memories. It depends on our background. But we have these triggers like our spouses, work, finances, feeling like nothing's supporting us, feeling all alone. Um, mm. And it all comes down to the traumas we endured that are stored below the conscious level and the core beliefs that were stamped and imprinted on those traumatic memories. Those Oof. core beliefs are, I'm all alone, no one's here for me, um, the world is not safe, I'm not safe, and then that makes your comfort zone about yay big, mm -hmm. right? right? So what we do is we dive into the tension we start to unlock it and release it with three things, the touch. So we touch the area of the body that's holding the cellular memories. Every time you have an emotional trigger on your stress, like your spouse, your kids, your parents, your job, a coworker, mm -hmm. a supervisor, an emotional trigger. I'm not talking about sitting in front of a computer and your back hurts. You know, I'm not really talking about being in traffic, but I'm talking about one of those emotional triggers. You're gonna have an area of tension inside your body. That area, is exactly where the cellular memories are stored. So when you touch that area with the calm cells in your hand, now you're starting to create an equilibrium from those very stressed cells to the calm cells and you create a connection. So now those cells that are holding the old memories feel that there's a connection. Now you start breathing deeply and slowly. Now you're breathing right into the tension. So now those old cells that hold the, feel, hold the fear feel connected and they're receiving oxygen. 
So now they have life force and they're connected. The third thing we do is use a mantra, the I'm okay mantra. We say it once per breath. So one time per breath, you would just touch, breathe. I'm okay. And it's a very slow cadence. Breathing again. I'm okay. We'll do one more. Breathing again. I'm okay. By three breaths, you might feel your heart rate start to relax. You're breathing a little bit mm. deeper. Your body might feel calmer. So what we do is we use this technique to activate the relaxation response. And that disengages the fight or flight reaction. Mm. Yeah. So I teach veterans and I teach folks that suffered from severe trauma that technique. And then we apply that technique to heal the past. So we go into those old memories, the original traumatic memories. And you use that technique to repattern the emotional energy inside the memory in two ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in two ways. First, you just think about it, and then you feel the stress, and then you move your hands to where the tension is. And you think about one of the more stressful moments in the memory, and you just hear yourself saying, I'm okay in the back of your mind. You do that for about 10 minutes, and you start to feel the tension release. But then you take it a layer deeper, and you imagine yourself inside the stressful memory breathing deeply and slowly, once per breath, saying, I'm okay. You see yourself doing that inside the memory. Mm. When you do that, you are releasing the stress and the tension, not only from the cells, but from the back of the psyche, from that old memory, so that when you reflect on that memory after this session, it doesn't trigger any emotion, any tension, any tightness in the body. And when that happens, I refer to that memory as resolved. You've resolved that original trauma when it comes to mind and you reflect on it and there's no reaction anymore. Wow. And the triggers that might have uh, brought that up don't, you know, are, I mean, are those triggers no longer triggering or, you know, or, Great. or like, or, you know, mm -hmm. that is an awesome question. So I want to share, um, some feedback from a veteran from a few years ago at one of our retreats at Omega. She texted me two weeks after the retreat and she's like, I think something's wrong. So I called her and I'm like, what's going on? And she's like, my husband and my boss are saying the exact same thing to me that they were saying before I left, only I'm not saying anything back. I have no emotional response. And I said, well, tell me what's, what's happening if I'm a fly on the wall. My husband will come into the room. He'll say what he was normally saying that would trigger me, get a reaction. We would fight. And I just look at him. And I'll say, how do you feel? She's like, I feel just kind of clear. Like I don't even care to engage. And I'm like, okay, is that better than the fight? And she's like, yeah. I'm like, okay, you're exactly where you need to be. Like that's, that's the result that we're going for. And the idea is this, if you have a dance partner in this karmic stress dance that we're doing with our spouses or supervisors or colleagues or our kids, and then all of a sudden you stop dancing, guess what? The dance is over right? Yeah. It only takes one person to break the chain. And the way I explained it to her was, we emptied the tank that was fueling your side of the reaction. Mm -hmm. We went into the source and we expressed it all and let it all go. Mm -hmm. We accepted it, expressed it, forgave it, and released it. So when your husband and your supervisor comes back in and says the same thing, there's no spark for the engine, right? There's yeah. no ignition. So the way I look at it as is going back to the iceberg. If you melt down from the center of the iceberg underneath the waterline, you melt that down. What's going to happen to the triggers on the top above the waterline? It's going right. to disintegrate and dissipate into the water, right? Now we're always going to have stress. And that's why stress stopper breath work is a really good technique to practice at night when you're going to bed and when you wake up in the morning. Yeah, I want to come back to that here in a second. Just uh, a lot of our audience may not know what, what you mean by that. But yeah. what about generational trauma? Uh, Will and I have had you know multiple guests on the show that have spoken about the generational trauma, right? I like I could live my life. I got it. Very very I unlikely. Mm -hmm. What's that? Oh yeah. No, yeah, I got. I, I, I have that. I have do, that right? shit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. But we could we could live our life theoretically, without experiencing any trauma ourselves, but we carry that trauma from our mothers, our fathers, and generations before. Does this work on generational trauma? Yeah, so 
the beautiful thing is when you're facilitating the energy, you could point it at any time, space, dimension. It doesn't matter where it's coming from. So the way I look at our bodies and our DNA is these are like karma bags, right? We are just here for a short sliver of time. <laughs> we're just we're just renting this this karma bag, this this right. thing, right? This bodysuit. We're renting it for a sliver of time. But hundreds, if not thousands of years of pain, trauma, and stress is passed down from our ancestors to the previous generations to right now. So ultimately, I feel like our soul is like a marionette puppet to all of the reactions programmed into our body and into our DNA. Mm. Yeah. So what I found is when you get to the original trauma and you bring the unconditional love in and the heart opens up to it, and you connect it with love because that's all pain wants is to be loved, then it totally changes from constriction to expansion and we're free of it. When you get to the core root of it and you do that, all those traumas start to fall like dominoes. But you have to get the original one. That It's like building a, a house of cards. That's what I feel mm -hmm. our psyche is like with all these stress stored in our body. When you get to that central card towards the bottom middle and you pull it, everything just in, implodes as we let it go. So there's generational trauma. There's um, people that have let go of memories from being on slave ships in in wow. um, in uh, my work. There's deep generational trauma just from the jealousy component that I inherited from watching my parents. You know, just from my father's side, right? I'll talk about that for a second. So my father had a very tough life. Um, he grew up around the block from my mom. And when he was five, his mother committed suicide in the house. Mm. She hung herself in the basement. Oh my, God. my father was then raised by an alcoholic uh, dad who was verbally abusive, uh, not physically, but verbally abusive. And then he went, he enlisted in the Marines uh, right around the time of the draft for the Vietnam War. When he had like two weeks to go, his older brother, who is his hero, Gary Cotter, uh, died in a car accident. Uh, Gary, my uncle Gary was a Golden Gloves boxer at the time, like toughest guy in the neighborhood type of guy, um, you know, was like my father's like go-to person in the world. So my dad flies back to make the um, funeral, but he missed it by a day. Mm. He missed the burial by a day for his brother. The military, the government made him go back to finish out his two weeks in Vietnam. Now, to this point, my father, at this point, my father was an M60 gunner. He already got malaria. He already got jungle rot. He was cutting out jungle rot from his, from his foot to stay in the jungle. He was cutting it out with his knife just so he could stay in the jungle to be with his brothers, right? When he was forced to go to a ship that was like a hospital, um, for malaria and some other uh, issues he was having. When he came back, his whole entire uh, group that he was with was wiped out. The entire group was gone. Oh my God. So back, yeah. So when he came back, when he had to go back for those two weeks, he knew he wasn't coming home. Mm -hmm. Right. He just went back saying, I'm going there to die. Right. But he did come home. He married my mom, had the two of us, had, you know, my brother John and myself. And when my father became a New York City firefighter, right, in the late 70s and the 80s, being a New York City firefighter was like a hurricane of self-coping with alcohol, drugs, partying, right? And he got sucked into that hurricane big time. So my mother divorced him when I was six. Getting back to the generational trauma, there was one night when we were very young, um, I wasn't aware that this happened until I was older. Uh, my mother told me uh, when I was asking her about my father after he passed, she said that he broke into the house. He took her downstairs, threw a belt over a rafter and was about to hang her. Oh, okay. Wow. And my mother said, God help me. And then he looked at her like he saw a ghost. And he, he said, what'd you say? And she said, God help me. And then he ran out of the house like he saw a ghost. Mm. So that conversation came up, you know, one time when I was talking to my mom and I was like, you know, dad felt like his demons were bigger than him. And, um, and she's like, Brett, you have no idea the demons that he had and what he faced. You have no idea. 
And the generational trauma is so deep. You know, when I said like we are marionette puppets from those traumas and reactions and actions that are programmed into our DNA, I'm not kidding. It takes like hedge clippers to cut through some of those cords to break us free from the pain that we inherited. Mm -hmm. Guess what? Everyone born here is innocent. We inherit this, we inherit all this deep level of shit from generations mm -hmm. past. That is, you know, and just this weekend, within 10 minutes, a veteran, I saw it shake free right out of his uh, central nervous system. And he's currently writing a um, testimonial. He said that wow. more than 10 years of therapy, um, he's done ketamine, a bunch of different things. And those are all really good as we're on the part of our healing journey, right? But he said, nothing was like this experience that took 10 minutes. Wow. And what I saw was all of his pain literally shake out of his central nervous system and release when we were doing the higher power affirmations and facing all of his survivor's guilt. He was facing wow. all of his survival's guilt because, and this is what I want to say to anyone with survival's, survivor's guilt. It's yeah. a super yeah. real thing, but I want to say this one thing, which is super important, which also helps set him free. Mm. Every soul that comes to this planet has an agreement with the creator. It's when they're born and when they leave. That is between that soul and the creator, when they are born and when they leave, period, the end. The folks that are around other souls when they leave, it is traumatic because it is part of our human programming. When we see someone leave, we want to make sure we ask ourselves, do we do everything that we could have done, right? To ensure they couldn't leave. So this way we protect somebody else. It's like a caveman old programming but we're caught in a catch 22. And I want to let you know that it is not your fault. It has never been your fault. Every soul has a predestined date and moment that they're born. And when they leave, you have nothing to do with it. You are just a player on the stage, but that is their agreement with the writer, producer, and director, not you. You have mm -hmm. your own agreement. Mm -hmm. Wow. I think you helped me understand original sin a little bit like because i was always you know from because i was raised catholic and baptized and stuff i'm like what do you mean original sin like you know i'm like a you know just a, i'm a i'm a sweet young kid who hasn't done a thing in the world but i'm a, you know i'm a i'm born with original sin i guess that could be the generational trauma that you're referring to i don't know i mean yeah. i don't mean to get like kind of uh you know uh, religious here but uh anyway it's just like it may <laughs> sounds like that those two things are the same you just gave me goosebumps because that's exactly what I'm talking about, Will. Um, mm -hmm. We, our souls come here innocent and we are rolled over by a thick layer of carpet karma. It's almost like a mm -hmm. thick carpet of karma that is imprinted on our soul. And as we go through life, we start to experience some of the heartache, the shame, the guilt, the pain, and all those reactions activate in our DNA, but that's all working together to bring us to a place where we can hopefully go underneath it all and unlock it and release it by finding ourselves in those deep moments. And ultimately it's coming back to this one truth that I'm aware of, like I'm aware of that I'm alive. And I'm also aware of that there are two forces in the universe. There's expansion and there's contraction. 99% of the universe is expanding. Love feels good because we get in flow with the universe when we are in love, because love is expansion. Pain is contraction and it feels like shit because we're going against the flow of the universe. Mm. So when we dive into the pain and we open up the unconditional love and you feel it coming from within, not from a pill, not from a yoga class, not from the bar, not from a meditation even, not from anything, but you feel it open up from the central column of your being and from your heart. And you love that pain because that all that pain ever wanted was love. You become one, not only with yourself, but also with the universe in and all around you. So ultimately, my message is love is the answer. Yeah. I don't know where you go from there. I mean, that's, that seems like a good, a good place to end the episode, but no, we're no, only no. about halfway through. Uh, man, yeah, I love that, Brett. But I, I want to yeah, I want to shift a little bit. Um, you know, we're, we're talking a lot about trauma. Obviously, that's what that's what we're here to talk about. But a lot of that trauma is obviously 
either in our own past or generational trauma like we just talked about. What about anxiety? Anxiety about mm. the future. And then you see, you know, the tagline at the bottom there is self-harm prevention. What are some things that people can do, not just to help to heal trauma from the past, but potentially develop their resilience for stress and anxiety from the future? What a great question. And, you know, I'm just loving this conversation, guys. And try and reel me in. I, I go off my tangents. <laughs> but yeah, that's what you're here for. <laughs> yeah, thanks. We will. <laughs> so um, we have a technique called the anxiety freedom technique. And this has been a lifesaver for me, right? Because I've been going through a lot with um, my son over the last, you know, 18 months or so. He's, you know, from the time he was 17 to now 19, um, it's brought up a lot of anxiety in me, right? So this is a technique that I developed when COVID started, when I heard about nurses and doctors in the parking lots crying before and after their shift. And then when they get home in their driveway in their car crying uncontrollably because they were facing a tsunami of stress and they didn't have any answers for it. So this was the answer I came up with. And I sent it out to the American Nursing Association and all the different state representatives right um, after like three months after COVID started. So long story short, here's what I want you to do when you're feeling generalized anxiety or you feel like you can't sleep and you have that pit in your stomach or in your chest and it's just you're anxious and you don't know why. I want you to take a piece of paper. I want you to write out everything that's freaking you out from one to 10, list it all out. Then I want you to look at the list and circle the one thing that's freaking you out the most, that one stressor that's freaking you out the most. And then ask yourself these two questions. What's the worst case scenario of that stressor? Mm. And then ask this question, what's my biggest fear about that worst case scenario? When you do that, you surface the core fear that's fueling your body's stress. This is what your cells are stressed out about, okay? Now you're activating the subconscious, okay? You're probably gonna cry, you're gonna feel, everything is on the source, okay? I want you to touch the tension, start breathing into it, let the emotional cake bake, start expressing it, okay? And then I want you to do a simple technique that I teach in the workshops. Um, you just say, whatever your higher power is, I'll use the word source, right? Source of the universe. Source, shine your light through all this pain in my heart. Unlock and release the fear of losing him or whatever the fear is that surfaced. I reclaim my true identity just as the creator created me. And then you breathe deeply and slowly, you let more layers come up. It's like peeling back an onion, okay? Then when the next layer comes up, you express all the emotional pain, and then you do it again. Source, shine your light through all this sadness in my solar plexus. Unlock and release it right now. So you're commanding the greater part of you to work through and release the tension from you. So that's what we do with anxiety. Uh, yeah, I love it. Um, and, and then I want to take that one step further. And I you know we just had a conversation about your was it your father's father? No, sorry, father's mother who who hung herself, hanged, hanged herself. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> let's talk about self harm prevention and suicide prevention. And I know in your in your PDF that you sent us to kind of prepare for this show, you talk about the SIG suicide prevention protocol. Can you talk a little bit about that self harm prevention and that suicide prevention protocol? Yeah, yeah. So it's the stress is gone suicide prevention protocol. Um, this came about when the Department of Veterans Services Commissioner James Hendon invited me and my wife to this veterans event at City Field uh, where the Mets play. And it was all like New York City, tri-state area, uh, veterans service providers and uh, veterans, right? So I met the CEO of another really amazing nonprofit in the New York City area. And he said, look, we have su six suicide prevention specialists that work our hotline. They don't feel um, very confident handling suicidal ideation with the veterans on the phone and they encounter a lot. Is there any way you could train us? And I've been wanting to train a suicide hotline for the last 15 years, 
Okay. I could never get anyone that ran it to bite on my pitch. Mm -hmm. Right. But wow. now I have a company asking me. So I dove in, created the whole protocol in about a month, and then we trained up their staff in about three weeks. Nice. So the protocol, yeah. So the protocol, I researched the best practices of what's happening today. And then I looked at all the stress is gone methodologies and I married them together and honed it and dialed it in to something that is saving lives in such a beautiful way. So I call it CPR for folks suffering with suicidal ideation. And it's compassion, presence, and relaxation. Okay. Typically, when you call a suicide hotline, the person's trying to figure out, are you looking to talk? Do you want services? Or do they have to call uh, 911, the police, or an ambulance, right? So what we do is we do have our risk assessment questions, the same one that they use. And you know we have our whole protocol of how to call 911 and do all that stuff. But what we do differently is we ask a number of questions that open up plumes of their emotional pain and help them release it, okay? So I'll give you an example. Let's say a veteran calls the hotline and they are really upset. And we just say, oh my gosh, please tell me more. Now they start opening up at a different level. And then you say, wow, I want to hear everything. And then you let them go. They say, every, they say whatever's coming up. And you say, that sounds really painful. What's the hardest part to talk about? Now you're digging deeper. And you let them go. You let them talk. You let them express, right? And then you say, my God, what is your biggest fear about that? Now you're unearthing what their body is freaked out about. Okay. Yeah. Now you have surfaced that core fear that's driving them, that's activating all their death drives. Okay. Once we have that core fear on the table, then we start to encourage them just saying, um, I'm right here with you. I'm not going anywhere. Do you happen to feel any tension in your body? And then we bring them through the TMR technique to release the tension from that core fear the area that has a cellular memory and any other flashback memories that pop up while we're talking to them. And then we teach them stress stopper breath work. The cool thing is I'm training local crisis lines so they can actually schedule the veteran to come in the next day. Nice. One nonprofit takes it a step further. If the veteran doesn't want to come in, they'll send somebody out to have lunch with them in their neighborhood, which is which is like the next level of where I feel suicide prevention, especially for veterans and first responders really needs to go. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, the, if a, if, if a veteran or, or anybody for that matter is at that level where they're calling a suicide hotline, their ability and their desire to go and have coffee with someone to actually seek them out, to go to them versus have somebody come to them. Is, uh, is significantly different. So that's that's fantastic that that Veterans Service Organization is doing that. Uh, Will, I've talked quite a bit here. <laughs> I'll turn it back over to you. No, I, I mean, I, the, the technique that you're developed and working with uh, and helping people with, it just, I, I like uh, how you just let them talk. And uh, when, you know, and you're like kind of letting the energy out. And when you talk, you know, also, and you, and when you're really talking from a very raw place, it's like you know, coming from the kind of the yoga work that I do, and, and and like and the understanding of yoga and the chakra system, the energy system is like when you're expressing your voice, you're actually beginning to also open up and speak from your heart, and uh, it just seems like this is just such a, a very uh, it, obviously it's an impactful way to kind of um, just bring some clarity around the suffering that you're experiencing by energetically expressing what that is by speaking of it. Um, and, and then like, but also like, and as they speak of it, uh, you know, the crisis hotline person or whoever the therapist or something like that can really get clued in to really how to help them. Um, instead of, uh, you know, sometimes just trying to like put everybody into the same, you know, uh, way, of, of fixing them or something like that. So it's just, I, I love that the method is, is, is unique. I mean, to the individual, um, but also really meets them on that energetic level in which they're struggling at and on. Right. Yeah. I mean, I love how you put it. And I feel like you definitely understand and can see the process and connecting. Yeah. So one of the things that we train our crisis counselors in is 
Less is more. Listen, empathy, and sympathy. With no go. judgment and no interruptions. Right. No judgment, yeah. no interruptions. Right. And the key there is in our training, and we actually have veterans come in that have called the suicide hotline that, you know what I'm saying? We don't have, we start off role playing with each other and then I play the veteran and then they play the veteran for each other in teams. And then we actually have veterans calling in and coming into our training rooms. And the main thing that I train the counselor for is to embrace and release their own stress when they hear the worst case scenario coming from the other end. Because what happens is when a crisis line representative or a suicide prevention specialist hears those words, I want to kill myself, I'm thinking about killing myself, I have the means, mm. their body goes into a stress reaction, okay? And now they start reacting. They start jumping in. They start doing things from a stress place. And that makes the matters worse. It's almost like throwing uh, gas on a fire, right? So what we want to do and what I teach people to do is anytime you're getting upset while you're listening, you touch the tension, breathe deep and slow and release it so you can be present. That's the CPR, compassion, presence, and relaxation, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So the counselor enters the conversation compassionately. They maintain and anchor in their own presence so they could really observe the person's pain coming up. And then the relaxation component is they tailor the technique to release the pain from the individual's body and their mind. So it's been something that is um, truly saving lives. It's, it was, it's the most uh, rewarding training that I do because I know the folks are doing the work. Um, it's like spreading out. It's like a positive fractal in the universe. And I feel it's, it's spreading out in a place that is so needed, right? And um, the feedback has been awesome. The results have been awesome. I've trained two staff, uh, two different staffs so far. And um, everyone's been great. They do it with their family at home, right? So when you have teenagers that aren't, that you um, have tension with, one of uh, the trainees taught their eight-year-old son who was getting anxious before he goes to school and he went to go wake him up and he was doing stressed off of breath work in the morning by himself <laughs> when he uh, went to go wake him up. So kids, and it really is a positive impact on children, uh, teenagers, and the familial relationships between mother and daughter, father and daughter, father and son, you know, it really is helpful just to like not judge, just listen and lean in with like that childlike curiosity and compassion of just wanting to witness. Yeah. Right. Right. You mentioned stressed stopper breath work uh, a few times. What, what exactly is that? How does it look different from any other breath work? Can you explain that for, for myself and Will and, and obviously yeah, our, our audience as well? Yeah, yeah. So I'll, we'll do a deep dive on it. I touched on it a few times. So back in the day uh, when I started coaching people, I was focusing on helping them heal that original trauma, let's say with their mother that was repeating on how they related to women, right? And it was just a big trigger. Then we would heal the original trauma. They would come back to me and say, this was amazing. I'm not you know, triggered by my spouse anymore. but I'm at work or I'm in my commute and I'm getting anxious. I'm in, I'm waiting in a line, you know, at the bank or in the food store and I'm getting anxious. What do I do? So I created stress stop or breath work when I was looking at the, uh, that choking sign in a restaurant, you know, like it says like yeah. what to do if someone's choking. I'm like, we need one for stress. So I looked into it. Not, there wasn't any. <laughs> so, so I made it and that's what stress stop or breath work is. So the first step is you touch the tension. The second mm -hmm. step is you start breathing deeply and slowly. And the third step is once per breath, silently say, I'm okay. You repeat mm -hmm. those three steps together, breathing deeply and slowly until the tension goes away. Okay. Now, the first step is very important. The area of tension when we're stressed is where the cellular memories live. Touch is very healing. There is endless amounts of healing techniques. I'm sure that we're both, all three of us are aware of. Um, that heal just based on touch, right? So when these calm cells touch the tense cells, there's an equilibrium that comes about a balancing right. and it helps our cells come back into homeostasis quicker. When we are stressed, the cells that are holding tension, the cell membrane is very thick. So oxygen cannot get in or out. But as we touch and we start breathing deeply and slowly, the cell membrane starts to get to its designed state. So oxygen can pass through in and out of the cell, 
Okay. Mm-hmm. So that's one thing that happens now. Our stress and our fear, it feels connected through the touch. It's getting the life force that it needs. And then once per breath, it hears the soft mantra, like a soft whisper of the universe, I'm okay. The I'm okay mantra is the reverse logic that programmed our fight or flight reaction, which is I must run or fight to stay alive. So it's like throwing three monkey wrenches at the same time into our stress reaction. So that's why it works so fast. That's what I believe it works so fast. And I submitted the scientific data behind those three tech, those three modalities working at the same time to the American Institute of Stress in 2012, and they certified the technique. Oh, nice. Yeah. Yeah. And that that's the same technique that you mentioned at the beginning. Right. For acknowledging the trauma bubbling up, knowing where it is and putting your hand on it, putting a touch on it, then breathing, and then I'm okay. So you can use the same thing for trauma as you can for stress, or rather you can use the same thing for stress as you can for trauma. Let me say Um, it this way. Stress stopper breath work is the best duct tape in the moment, right? It's the best duct tape in the moment. It works, but it doesn't address the core. In order to address the core, we have to express our feelings, Okay. right? Mm -hmm. Right now I'm feeling all this sadness in my heart. Then you breathe deeply and slowly. You let it get a little bit bigger. You'll actually feel the tension expand as you're breathing into it. Then you would try to tune in right underneath the sadness and express from there. It feels like X, Y, and Z. It was triggered by my spouse or it was triggered by my son or daughter. It might be related to, and then you think back to the household you grew up in. And now a whole nother layer, like a deeper gear emerges with more feelings and more emotions and more fears. You do the same technique. You touch it. You breathe deeply and slowly, and anywhere between 5 and 15 minutes, the tension starts to release. Your cells have been waiting to do this. It's our minds that identify with the pain. Any pain anyone ever experiences emotionally, mentally, is coming up to leave the body. The issue is it's a catch-22 because as it rises, our mind identifies with it, and we push it back down. So the idea is this, as it arises up, whatever's coming up, my life was a waste, mm. right? Everyone's better off without me. Nothing's working. Mm. Whatever's coming up, going right into the tension, breathing deeply and slowly, embracing all your emotions that come up, expressing all your thoughts, identifying with nothing, none of it, letting it all just come up and go because it will. The body knows how to do this. We just have to train our brain and our mind to do this. And eventually it becomes like a chimney. You have logs in the fireplace and everything just slowly burns out and it goes into the atmosphere and is gone. And then the chimney's clear and there's no logs left. There's only ashes, right? Mm. So that's the open space that we create when we get to the original stuff that was bothering us. Yeah, I love I love your metaphors and your analogies and your your yeah. acronyms. This, this, you're talking to a military yeah. guy, so the acronyms are big for me, and the, the metaphors helps me to kind of envision it. So go ahead. Yeah, thank you. I mean, yeah, I mean, I just want to make a comment, and then I have a question, you know, about some misconceptions about trauma. Um, but like, I love when when you're accessing and feeling where that pain is where that sensation is or or where you know that where you're being triggered physically and then speaking to that place i'm safe um uh you know you're you're kind of like we're getting you know come back into the energy in the body like we're getting in to the deepest level of our energetic self which is like our root so you're getting almost to the root of our existence by saying i'm safe because we don't have that like you know down in our back to more, I don't know why you have so much yoga is coming up today, but it's like we're energetic beings and, and, and you're speaking in an energetic way. And in our, in our lowest uh, you know, energetic, um, not not state, but lower energetic chakra or, um, is is our mula, uh, muladhara, it's called. And um, uh, it's our sex, food, and money. So it's our basic survival and it's our safety. And if we don't feel safe at our deepest energetic level, then the whole, the rest of our energetic system is out of whack because we're not really grounded into a sense of safety, you know? So I guess it's like, I mean, I could see, you know, it's like almost like neuro linguistic programming in some ways, or like, you know, you're using positive affirmations to speak to our, to speak to yourself in a way that reminds you like, you know, 
that we are safe. And, um, and when we have that energy and that experience of being safe, I'd imagine it allows everything else that's getting in the way or, or uh, of us being safe just starts to slowly disappear. I mean, that is, is that great. Kind of, yeah. That is such a great point. And personally, I feel the karma of humanity is to love the pain in the body to set us all free. Okay. So what we're doing with this work is identifying where the pain is, embracing it, letting it talk, giving it a voice, not Mm. trying to shove it down, letting it come up gently, lovingly, just like in the suicide prevention protocol, we're letting everything come up, but only now we're doing it on ourselves. We're letting all that pain come up. And then we're breathing underneath it, breathing even deeper and slower, unlocking and releasing the pain from where it hooked Mm. into our cells. And ultimately what we're doing is mentoring the body through the mind, right? We're mentoring the body through the periphery and through the interface of the mind, right? But ultimately it's our consciousness that is doing this, right? And the ego is is what will fight this work tooth and nail. So I'll give you an example. When your core pain comes up or any pain and you touch it and you say, I'm okay, your pain goes bullshit. (laughs) I ain't okay. Like, and then you let all that resistance come up too. And then you breathe into it and you express more of it. And then you come back to the I'm okay mantra. Ultimately, one of my favorite mantras is I'm alive. Okay. Because that's the ultimate truth that, that I, that's probably the only truth that I know I'm alive. (laughs) <laughs> right. that's true so, right that's, that's all i got right i'm alive right. Right. <laughs> you know what i'm saying yeah so like, yeah. people ask me how you do it i'm like i'm alive you know right. so <laughs> but snarky we? motherfucker i'm alive <laughs> dude all right no, i'm just kidding sorry <laughs> but seriously I'm you know sorry. what i mean so i'm sorry yeah. when my cells are like you know want to fight me and my ego wants to fight me on it i just i breathe deeply and slowly express that so i'm not trying to cover up any pain, any emotion, any negative thinking, we're just venting it all out. That's all. Yeah. Powerful. Really powerful to release that energy. Um, yeah. Uh, right, so the, what's, uh, so mis- what are misconceptions? Yeah. That you, you oh yeah, exactly. That's where I go. Yeah, of course. Yeah. The, uh, I was getting her, John. I'm yeah, on no, it. I'm on it. it. I'm on it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so, yeah. No, so yeah. So, I mean, we've talked a lot about the energy of trauma and just the energy of experience. Uh, you know, what are some common misconceptions that about trauma and, and, and its recovery. I'm sure you see a lot of it out there with different people you're working with. I mean, you've already been having a, a lot of success with your own protocols. So uh, what are some maybe misconceptions that you continually fight against in order to really um, you know, do the good work that you're doing? The problem is Groundhog Day. Mm-hmm. We live in Groundhog Day. And what I want to say is this, you know, we have between 12,000 and 60,000 thoughts every day. Mm-hmm. 75% are negative. 95% of those are repeating from yesterday. Right. Yeah. We live in Groundhog Day. Our ego and our survival system in this bodysuit, in this karma bag, has chosen to do exactly what we did yesterday to get through today. Right? So we are... And we work like clockwork, okay? We were designed to survive like clockwork, only living in an overpopulated planet that has a ton of stress and anxiety in it and trauma in it. We're caught in a catch-22 where we're living rinse and repeat every freaking day. So I feel like the biggest um, misconception is that you can't let go of it quickly. Like every time I talk to someone that has like, 20 or 30 years um, experience in the mental health field, except the true ones that are really open. There's this woman, Pam, Dr. Pamela Hall in uh, uh, Orange County, California. She's one of the real ones. You know, she's worked with, I think it's, she said up to like 40,000 veterans or something crazy. Yeah. It's amazing. She's just like, <laughs> I'm not worthy. Like I, I put her up there, you know what I'm saying? Like, like she's yeah. one of those. We did, we did a live like uh, six months ago and we, we chopped it up. And, um, but for the most part, when I come across with people with a lot of indoctrination about mental health and this and that people feel that you can't let it go or it's going to take 10 years. It's a falsehood. The spirit wants to work through you. The energy that's ready to heal you is waiting to get through. 
Once you surface the core fear, you've activated the subconscious. Now the whole universe is listening to you. You become a player. You're like at the plate now. Now, if you start to command your own divine essence or source or the universe or God or whatever you want to call it to shine light through and unlock and release that tension from within you, guess what, my brother? Guess what, my sister? You feel it unlock and release. You feel layers of the onion just... So it doesn't take long. I had a woman, a Navy veteran, schedule an appointment with me. It was like maybe a year after COVID kicked in and I was really busy. And I sent her this link to my uh, a YouTube video that I have out. It's a half hour link. It was for people that had a long wait to get to me. And it's like having a half hour session. So she scheduled a session with me a week out. She was in a lot of pain. I said, hey, watch this video. It'll take the edge off. She emailed me the next day and she said, Brett, I'm canceling my session. I don't need to do it. She's like, the, wow. the anxiety is gone. The pain's gone. So like it works. Just the, the only thing that blocks us from healing is our own beliefs around not healing. That's wow. it. Wow. There you go. That's, yeah. that's one of the big misconceptions. Well, being so attached to our pain, you know, being yeah. again, Groundhog Day, right? I mean, we are, we yeah. are sad. We are uh, in a great ways and obviously very destructive ways, creatures of habits. And if we are not aware of our habits and therefore all the energy that we put in behind our habits and all those habits are just driving our actions and continually you know, coming back and looping those emotions again. And we're just like living a, you know, maybe a trauma filled life mm -hmm. and experiencing the same results. It's like, how can you ever get out of that? But then, you know, yeah. Yeah. So, so Will, you, you hit the nail on the head about, you know, becoming aware of our behaviors and our actions and our reactions, right? Yeah. It was 12 years ago, I created PTSD free. It's a mobile app. And um, now we just upgraded to PTSD keys. But one of the functions is um, the app asks you three questions, right? Mm -hmm. And then it predicts your stress reactions with an 85% accuracy rate. And it pings you three minutes before you get stressed with stress stop or breath work. So when the trigger shows up, you're calm and you're grounded and your consciousness is anchored. So when that reaction kicks in in you, you have an open doorway to make some choices now. Are you going to mm -hmm. let the animal body react, right? The, the, the body, the mammal body react and take over and hijack your consciousness? Or are you going to take a few more moments, breathe deeply and slowly, and then address the stress with your consciousness? Respond mm -hmm. to it with authenticity. So. That app works with, again, predicting your stress reactions, right? With a very high level of accuracy. All the app asks you is, when are you most likely to get stressed out, right? And you take one stressor at a time. Let's say it's with your spouse. And you think, when, am I, when, when do I most likely get stressed with my spouse? Okay, it's when I'm coming home from work. It's when we're getting the kids ready for, for bed between six and eight, whatever, right? Then what days is it the worst? It's the worst between Monday and Wednesday because Thursday and Friday, she's working late and I do it all on my own and it's just a little bit better on those days. So then now the app knows when you're most likely to be stressed. Most of our stress is like clockwork, like what you said, because we're creatures of habit. We just never thought of it that way. Most of it is like that. The only random ones are the ones like, and again, nothing's random, but the random ones, if like someone cuts you off and gives you the finger in the car or whatever, stuff like that, right? Those are the ones that are kind of unplanned, right? But for those ones, we have one touch functionality where you just touch the icon on your phone screen and then automatically you're breathing deeply and slowly with the app with one touch. So it's really just bringing more consciousness and more awareness to when we're stressed. Right. That's really cool. Yeah. Um, is there... Or are there any plans on integrating that with any type of wearable technology? Like w Will and I both wear, <laughs> wear the, this Whoop wearable that, that obviously tracks our heart rate, heart rate variability, those types of things. Would it, would it be something that they could integrate with some technology? So if that random stressor happens, like that jerk cuts us off in traffic or they flip us the bird and, and then yeah. we, we feel that stress, could it pick that up? Yeah, so this is really cool. A Marine was in um, a one-day workshop I did about nine months ago, and she had what was it, the aura the ring? Aura ring, aura right? ring yeah. yeah. And um, she came up to me after the after the workshop. She goes, "Look at this. Look, here's the printout of what happened. Like, here was the the the, uh, the chart." Yeah. 
Yeah. So when we were doing the stress assessment, her stress went all the way up. And then when we went to the, as we were expressing it, it went all the way down underneath restore mode, which oh, wow. is all mm. the way at the bottom. And, and then she went up a little bit from restore and then we ended the workshop. Right. So I feel like the wearables and stuff like that. Um, there's like a whole untapped universe for the stresses going yeah. to tech. Yeah. So what I'm working on now doing is, and it's kind of been an uphill battle is trying to find an investor to work with us, to partner with us so we could actually create new apps because I, <laughs> I'm like, you know, Robin from Peter to pay Paul to do all this stuff, right? It's just me and my wife kind of like, <laughs> like the wild west doing the retreats and creating yeah. the apps. And, yeah. you know, so, so we're looking to really um, find an investor that can partner with us to help create the next phase using some new AI stuff with decision tree stuff that I've created from my coaching to that we could like just duplicate it and have it everywhere effortlessly. So, um, so yeah, so we're not into the, the wearables yet, but we are, that's, that's in the near future. We're just trying to get the, uh, identify the right investor. So yeah. my, my next question is somewhat related to that, right? The, the wearables track our, uh, us and may be able to predict based on your app. We, um, yeah, it also, but, it also the, let me just say, John, the Whoop actually tells me my stress level sometimes, yeah, which is interesting. Yeah. You know, but plus what, 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 and, and Brett, what Brett was saying is also, if it knows my time of day, knows my actions, knows like typically the kids are coming home at this time and I'm usually a little ramped up, you know, maybe that's like you get the recipe or something like that. But anyway, John. In, you, know, well, you know, we're creating the technology right here. But yeah, uh, that's right. <laughs> hey, everybody! I need everybody to sign an NDA. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. yeah, don't say anything. Don't say anything. So, um, yeah, let's stop recording right now. So, I yeah. was thinking, um, you know, in in predicting the the future, but let's let's talk about knowledge of the now, right? Mm-hmm. What I mean by that is how can someone be aware of trauma that they've been exposed to that they haven't had bubble up from the cellular level, right? And then if they are not even aware of it, what are the effects of long-term, what are the effects of not addressing trauma, past trauma? Yeah, so it's a really loaded question. So I feel not addressing trauma uh, shortens your lifespan, oh wow! And and it decreases the quality of your life and of your relationships. Sure. Right. How many people have you heard say, you know, I feel like I'm alive, but I'm not living, or something along those lines? Right. Like I'm alive, but I feel like I'm not living. I'm just like here, going through the motions, and so it's not a fulfilling life, right? And the way I feel we get to the source is by looking at our trigger. Right. And then we use those details as a flashlight to uncover the source. And I'm going to share a little bit of the magic with you right now. So let's say your spouse is your biggest trigger. And I encourage you to write down the days and times that it normally happens or most often happens. This way, you're not so surprised by your stress. You're expecting it. Okay. That's part of the same issue. Think about this. Why are you surprised by the same stress hundreds and thousands of times? from the same person saying the same things. At some point, light bulb should go off as we awaken and bring more consciousness to our stress. That's how much it hijacks our minds. So the way we do it is we write down the thoughts and the emotions that we're feeling in the moment while we are triggered and activated by our number one trigger in our life. I want you to start there Mm. and write down the location of tension. Then you ask yourself, when's the first time I can remember having this thought and this feeling together at the same time. Mm -hmm. And then you start looking at like 10 year chunks of your life, me in my thirties, me in my twenties, me in college, me in past relationships, me in high school, me in elementary school. And then the ultimate one, the way to get back there real quick is to look back on the household you grew up in and answer this question. What was the energy like inside the household you grew up in? If it was chaotic or stressful, who is responsible for that chaos? If it was your mother or if it was your father, what did you want to say? What does your eight-year-old kid want to say to your mother? <laughs> Tears, boom, you're there in one minute. Wow. 
You let them express it all. And then you then typically I guide them through an inner child um, visualization where their inner child expresses everything they ever wanted to say to that parent that took their power away, that disconnected them from love. Then they reconnect with their own sense of self-love. Look that parent in the face and say, I don't need you to love me because I have God in me. When they visualize this, they are literally, their consciousness is transported back into the household, right? It's like an out-of-body experience. Their eyes are closed. They see everything. They feel everything. And then we anchor in the unconditional self-love from deep within. Then I have them come back to this present time, space, and dimension where we are in our coaching session or in a retreat or in a workshop. And then they open up their eyes. And they're a changed human being. A lot of great work. Yeah. Oh, God. We're getting, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm really impressed with what you've done, Brett. We're getting kind of close to the end here. Uh, let's just, should we talk a little bit about uh, John, a little mindfulness and meditation, how it helps or what it does? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah, let's, so, yeah. I mean, because, you know, we're men talking mindfulness and we have meditations all the time. We talk about it. So, uh, um, what do you use or, or how helpful is, uh, and, uh, like mindfulness and meditation, uh, in, overcoming trauma or, 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 you know, being more aware of it. So I would love to hear some stories from you both too, because I have a feeling there's probably a treasure trove in this, in this topic for us all. But just for myself, I'll say from when I first got into meditation, I, I have like an addictive personality, right? There were points on the weekends where I was meditating for like eight hours in my first year, because I like wanted to dive in. And there'll be times where I was just sitting there and like, an old experience will just gently, like the emotional, the energetic imprint of that experience will just float up from the center of my consciousness and I'll see it, I'll acknowledge it, and it'll leave, right? Mm -hmm. So in those cases, like it could be an image of me and my dad or me and my mom or me by myself or something that happened to me. And I feel like when we are in an energetic space of a deep meditation, we're telling ourselves that number one, we're safe. Because we could sit here with our eyes closed and be awake and not be worried for our survival. So right there, we're throwing another monkey wrench into our stress. So our stress really settles down and our consciousness starts to arise, almost like a flower that arises in the crack in the concrete in the city, right? Or a blade of grass. So that natural consciousness comes up from within us when we sit in a deep state of meditation. And when those old memories come up, or maybe you just feel like a, a crying for like 30 seconds and then that leaves. Everything's just leaving, almost like with that chimney um, imagery, right? So I was just curious, did you guys ever have anything like that when you were in meditation or how meditation has helped you all with the traumas that you guys went through? Because I feel I, like we're I, in very similar zones, you know what I mean? As yeah, far as yeah. I, I've, I, I've done quite a bit of uh, Vipassana meditation, which is like the you know, the 10 days in silence and, you know, 10 hours of meditation a day. And, you know, it's uh, when you really, and it's all like basically the body scanning technique, you know, it is like, you know, most of the, of the 10 days is body scanning. And just by being with things as they are, uh, really getting into a deep state of stillness and peace and relaxation, uh, I mean, physically, there's a lot going on emotionally uh, all the time. And mentally, um, but from that deeper state of physical rest, um, I, you, I, things would just start coming up to the, from the surface, coming from deeper within inside me, uh, and I'm able to just you know they kind of, they bubble up like you're kind of from that cellular level or from whatever from my consciousness or from the energetic you know uh, layers of just you know the calm what does sankara right? Layers of trauma, layers of stress, layers of, of, of like deep, uh, maybe suppression of my experience. They just start coming to the surface and, um, and me not reacting to them and just like letting it arise and pass away. Uh, it just starts to heal me slowly because, um, instead of letting pushing, suppressing or, or fighting with whatever that energetic, uh, emotional experience, whatever that physical experience could be, it could be either or that mental anguish I'm experiencing. Uh, it just, and by not reacting to it, 
right? And noticing every change, everything is changing all the time. And just kind of, and it goes, it rises and kind of pass away. Um, and um, I'm able to achieve more clarity and and um, and just feel a greater state of peace. But it's like it's so. I, I meditate every day um, because I want to stay fresh. I want to stay clear. Um, but to go into like do a really deep, like you're talking like eight hours of meditation, you really get calm mind, calm body, and all the stuff on that cell, all the stuff on the cellular, cellular energetic level of this like of the trauma or the stress or whatever it is that that is agitating us just starts to come to the surface, and at least it gives us a place that we can observe and we can uh, heal um, instead of just you know, taking another pill or, you know, trying to do another workout or a new workout that is just um, not really fixing the problem. It's just throwing like another Band-Aid uh, instead of really healing on the cellular and soul level of, of things. So that it's, was amazing. It's really, yeah, yeah. That was amazing. And, and it just brought up one thing, if I could just share, like yeah, when you yeah, said, yeah. it like bubbles up when you're really deep in there and yeah. it just bubbles up and then it just mm. kind of like floats away. It's almost like reminds me of, the matrix when neo and uh, morpheus are, are learning how to fight uh, he's training neo in the simulation like yeah. in that room i don't know if you remember that scene or if you're it's into like, that movie or whatever <laughs> yeah right <laughs> so i feel like the meditative space is like a simulation for us to observe it and come up and leave the way we're supposed to do it here in reality you know it's like a safe simulation where we can't really get hurt and yeah. we you said it so perfectly, like it bubbles up and then it comes up and it leaves. And that's yeah. what we're meant to do in the heat of the moment, believe it or not, unless our life yeah. is in danger. Unless our life is in danger, that's when our fight or flight comes in perfect. You know, like if I'm walking in the city and I hear a horn beep on my left and there's a bus barreling down on me and then I jump back and land on the hood of a car, that's a great stress reaction. But yeah, the ninety nine percent of all the other ones suck. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like yeah. It, it, yeah. Just, it's just hurting us. It's not helping us. But yeah. that was a great well, explanation of what you uh, what you kind of shared yeah. there. Will that was awesome. Uh, uh, thank you. Well, bringing up the matrix, but even in that scene, doesn't he say? He says, "Come on!" Like there's something about let go, right? Like don't hold back, right? And that's so key to all of this. It's like you, you know, we we really need to surrender. We really need to let go in order to get down to that deeper level of our consciousness, to get deep into like the essence you said before of our humanity. And when we get to that level, right, um, there's just, and, I, and I've seen it, I've experienced it in meditation, like there is a, a deep state of happiness, of harmony, of bliss, of gratitude that is in every single cell of our body. And, and if we can access that deep inherent wisdom that's in every single one of us, that's in every single one of our cells, that's when we can really start to heal. But in order to get that, in order to do that, we must slow down. We must meditate. We must get to know our breath. Uh, without, you know, without those, th I mean, I, I don't, this is the only way, this is the way that I've learned to heal and what I've learned to continually stay fresh and the, and the platform that I continually create in order to grow and, and get beyond the stuff that it doesn't work for me and grow into something that does and, and works not just for myself, but just for everybody. Yeah. It helps me just become a better man and a better teacher and a better leader. And another gem, you brought up the idea of surrender. Yeah. Hello, this is like the key for us, you know what I'm saying? And to all my military, well, I'm, I'm, a vet I'm a civilian, I'm not a, a veteran, um, but I want to say to all the brothers and sisters that have served, are serving, when it comes to this, Surrendering is just surrendering the reactions of the body. That's the right. only thing you're surrendering, right? And we are not the body. We are the thing that controls the body. Mm. We are the thing that control. Are you the driver or the car? When you get into your car, you don't mm -hmm. become the car. You are the driver, right? Mm. And I'll just, 30 seconds to just prove yeah, my yeah. point. If you close your eyes and you imagine moving your right arm in a certain way, and then you move your arm in that certain way, right? Are you your body or the thing that decides how to move it? Mm -hmm. right. 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 Are you your yeah. body or the thing that decides how to move it? So when we surrender, all we're doing is surrendering those guttural, mm. <laughs> primordial instincts Habitual. and reactions of the yeah. body. 
Yes. Yeah. Wow. In the old programming. Yeah. Right. I'll touch so, on John, I would love really to... quick. Yeah, uh, really quick, but uh, I know we're coming to the end. It really, oh, for me, has to do with uh, judgment. Um, mm. I, I judge myself a lot for the trauma that I have. And then I judge myself for the feelings that I have about that trauma. And when I go into a meditation, yes, they bubble up, the, both the feelings and the trauma themselves. Uh, but also what I've found is I'm able to let go of that judgment through equanimity. Like mm. I say, you know what, it, this is how it is. This is how I am in the here and now. And of course I feel this way based on what I've experienced, what I've felt, of course I feel this way. And when I can give myself some grace through that equanimity, that's mm -hmm. when I feel I can let go of some of that trauma. Uh, and that's been wow. hugely helpful for me is, is I don't judge myself as often. So that's surrendering, wow. I guess, in a sense as well. So Absolutely. That, yeah, absolutely surrender. That is so deep, John. Yeah. That is so deep because of the density that you've walked through. Like the emotional weight that us civilians go through, it's deep too. It's deep, deep as hell, hell. But sure. I feel like you guys and gals that have been in the military, you walk through something and you experience things that we'll never be able to relate to fully because we weren't there with you. And when you say you're there with those feelings, I'm in awe, dude. That's like Thanks, amazing, man. You're really bringing a, a ton of consciousness. And like you, you said, grace, having grace with yourself. And I feel also like just letting those feelings have a voice, you know, not like shutting them down, just letting them have a voice. I call, I refer to crying as the emotional car wash. If you don't cry, the windshield gets a film of dirt and you can't see through it. You can't see through it. We're caught inside of it. Mm. But when we cry, the emotional car wash, now we can see out the wind, we can see out the windows, the windshield, we see where all the controllers are, you know, we can see what the road is. You know, it's it's like a whole different level. So right. my hat goes off to you and and to all you and all, everyone that's watching and all the service and my heart goes out to all of you, your families and everything you guys go through and all you guys go through. And um everyone. And Will's path, you know, spreading the love, the joy, and the consciousness, and all the work that both of you guys do together. I'm truly honored to be on this freaking show with you guys, like from <laughs> well, the bottom of my heart. You have no idea. It's an honor to have you here, Brett. Um, yeah, thank thanks, you so Brett. much. And, and uh, you know, to wrap it up, just before we get our, our breathing exercise here, and I also got to tell you guys, I, <laughs> I'm running on battery here and I've got 7% left. So hope we get through this. <laughs> Fuck, yeah. Turn down your screen a little bit, John. Turn down your screen. Man. Okay. Down. It's all the way down. Okay. No, wrap it up. <laughs> so real, no, real quick, okay. uh, what are some things that you're working on right now, Brett? How can we support you? How can our audience support you? And how can they find you if they're looking for you? Yeah, so stressisgone.com. We have our next retreat at the Omega Institute, uh, August 18th to the 23rd, coming up in about a month. And uh, we have veteran scholarships. I'm not sure how many are left because I think they've already given out a number of them. Um, but I would just look at the, go to eomega.org and then you'll see the other uh, workshop. You could apply for the scholarship and also reach out to me. Um, my number's on the website. Um, ask me any questions. My email is brett at stressisgone.com, brett with two T's. Um, our Instagram is stressisgone. Our YouTube is there. Uh, nice. Dive into the Stress is Gone uh, universe because we have a ton of free resources. I mean a ton um, for stress, anxiety. Uh, we have the PDFs. We have the videos. All that stuff is free. And then we have service offerings that go up from, you know, like $15 a month to the big retreats and workshops and stuff. Um, oh. Yeah. Amazing, man. And we'll make sure Excellent. all that's in the show notes. And now I'll turn it over to you to, to wrap it up with a, you know, maybe a two or three minutes uh, closing practice <laughs> for, <laughs> for our audience. So I'd love it to be longer, but I'll make, I want to make sure it doesn't <laughs> die. <Yeah. Do> it. <laughs> yeah. All right. So I invite anyone that's listening to this, if, if uh, just to get comfortable lie down on your back, place one hand on your heart. Obviously we can't do that right now, but lying down on your back, placing one hand on your heart, one hand on your belly button, 
closing your eyes, focusing your mind on following the airflow as you breathe deep and slow. Identifying any areas of tension inside your body. Just imagining you could breathe right through the center of the tightness. Gently unlocking and releasing it as you breathe deeply and slowly. Allowing thoughts to arise, gently refocusing your mind on following the airflow, coming back to the breath, breathing deep and slow. Allowing the airflow to saturate that area of your body. Breathing deeply and slowly. Allowing more thoughts to arise. Disappearing in the distance. Leaving you with a clear blue sky. Coming back to the breath inside your body. Breathing deeply and slowly. Allowing the air flow to go right into your heart. Unlocking and releasing tension from every single part. Bringing you deeper as you breathe even slower. Creating wide open space where there is no such thing as anxiety and you are completely free. Allowing that open space to expand inside your mind and body. Right now. And beginning to wiggle your fingers and your toes, your ankles and your wrists, your knees and your elbows, your shoulders and your neck, and open up your eyes when you're ready. Awesome. Thank you so much, Brett. This has been a wonderful, uh, wonderful experience, wonderful interview. Really appreciate everything that you shared with us today. Um, and I know yeah. that it's going to benefit us. It's going to benefit our audience. And uh, it's been fantastic having you, Will. Yeah. Hey, great way to kick off uh, our next season. Uh, thank you, Brett. Um, you know, diving deep into, you know, um, something that so many people struggle. We all we all have trauma, like all of it. I mean, everybody, whether it's like micro traumas throughout the day that we're dealing with. But, you know, to know that there's a path forward and know that we can heal ourselves from within it's just, it's so helpful for everybody. And I hope, you know, everyone is, anyone that's listening, share this. I mean, this is just such a, a, a great message, a great, uh, 
you know, I connect with Brett. I mean, Brett's doing a lot of great work out in the world. Maybe get on one of his retreats because, uh, or, or check out his book or the app that he's doing. Cause, uh, you know, we, you have the ability, you don't have to st stick and be with all the craziness of the mind all the time and all the habits that have, we've built around, you know, our trauma and our trend our generational trauma and stuff. So, um, thank you, Brett, for sharing all this. I really, really appreciate, um, what you're putting in the world. Thank you so much, guys. This was so real, man. Thank you so much. And uh, really honored to be here. Any veterans out there, um, please go to stressisgone.com if you're struggling. And even if you're not and you just want to connect. And anyone that's hearing this that manages a crisis line that wants to train their suicide prevention specialists or their peer-to-peer -peer mm -hmm. counselors, their vet-to-vet -vet counselors, please reach out to me at stressisgone.com. Um, that's one of the most rewarding things that I do in my life is train, uh, those folks in the suicide prevention protocol. So tough, I look forward to, uh, connecting down the road. And again, thank you guys for everything you shared and, and your life's path and your journey and the work that you do here. Pleasure, brother. Thank you. Yeah. And until next time, everyone take care. Yeah. Peace. 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 Hey, thanks, John. Thanks. Thank you for joining us today. We hope you walk away with some new tools and insights to guide you on your life journey. New episodes are being published every week, so please join us again for some meaningful discussion. For more information, please check out mentalkingmindfulness.com.